Hi everyone, and welcome to Lazy Lion. I think it's fair to say that we've never exactly been shy in proclaiming our love for the anime studio production IG's work. Nor have we ever shied away from highlighting badass female characters. So then throw in our love of history, fantasy, political intrigue, and amazing fight scenes. And is it really any surprise to see us covering this next anime entry? <laughs> Didn't think so. Morivito, Guardian of the Spirit, is one of our favorites, and we knew pretty much since the beginning of our channel that we'd eventually be covering this anime series. But what did surprise us though was just how many of you kept asking us to cover it. So here's hoping we do it justice. In this video, we'll not only be covering the characters and story of Moribito, Guardian of the Spirit, but also the creative process, as well as the real-world inspiration behind the world of Moribito and its history. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, be sure to stick around. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons to let us know. So what are we waiting for? Let's spearhead this thing! Start the intro! The story starts off by introducing us to Balsa, a 30-something-year-old spear wielder who makes her living as a bodyguard for hire. Shortly after finishing a job, Balsa makes her way to the capital of New Yogo, hoping to get her short spear repaired. But her plans go askew when upon crossing a bridge to enter the city, she witnesses what should have been a routine procession of the Imperial family turn deadly as the ox-driven palanquin falls into the raging river below it, taking its passenger with it. Without hesitation, Balsa jumps in and is able to save a young boy from drowning. Not wanting to linger though, Balsa leaves him with his retainers and quickly departs. But of course, as they say, no good deed goes unpunished, and Balsa soon realizes that she's being followed. When she finally comes face to face with her pursuers, and after a bit of a scuffle, she's told that they are royal emissaries who have been sent to find her by Her Royal Majesty the Second Empress, and that once she was found, she was to be brought to the Second Palace for an audience. This is when Balsa finds out that the boy she saved was none other than the second crown prince, Chagum, and that his falling into the river was no mere accident. In fact, it was an assassination attempt ordered by his own father, the emperor. Ooh, the political intrigue! You see, when the second empress learned that her son was suffering from unusual nightmares, she sent for a shaman and star reader to assess him. Unfortunately, when his symptoms were then made known to the holy sage at the palace, he prophesied that the prince had been possessed by a water spirit, and that this would lead to a massive drought that would cripple the empire for years to come if nothing was done about it. We're talking end of the world level stuff here. Now having a duty to his people and not wanting to risk losing his power, the emperor does what he feels he must. <coughs> Kill his son? Driven to desperation by the emperor's actions and impressed by Balsa's nerves of steel, the second empress beseeches Balsa to take her son and flee. It doesn't matter where as long as Balsa can keep him safe knowing that this is most likely a suicide mission, but feeling like she has little choice in the matter, Balsa agrees to take Chagum as her final mission. And so, in the middle of the night, both she and Chagum flee the palace. But can Balsa really save Chagum from his fate? And what about the prophecy? Can she prevent a catastrophic disaster from coming to pass? Whoop! Our lips are sealed! You'll just have to watch the series to find out. The anime series Moribito Guardian of the Spirit was released in 2007 by Production IG 
and was based on the popular internationally best-selling children's fantasy book series Moribito by the author Nahoko Uehashi. This is a name that might ring a couple of bells for some anime fans, since Production IG has actually adapted two of Uehashi's other series as well. Coming out just recently with the feature film The Deer King in 2021, which was based on the series by the same name, and then previously with the anime series Eren in 2009, which was based on the Beast Player series. What can we say? Uehashi is a skilled world builder who has a knack for creating some pretty compelling characters and storylines, something Production IG clearly took note of. Now, they just had to choose the right person who would be able to perfectly translate the source material of Moribito into a 26 episode anime series. This is where Kenji Kamiyama comes in. Working his way up first as a background artist on projects such as Akira and Pat Labor, Kamiyama finally got his break when he was invited to join legendary Ghost in the Shell creator Mamoru Oshii's team over at Production IG. Soon, he was working on projects like the 1999 animated film Jin Ro The Wolf Brigade as the animation director, and then on the 2001 classic Blood the Last Vampire as the screenwriter. These opportunities went on to land him in the director's chair of the Ghost in the Shell standalone complex series, where he directed two successful seasons. So now, having proved himself more than capable for the task, he was offered the chance to not only direct, but also screenwrite the Moribito series. And boy, did he not disappoint. One thing we greatly appreciated was that Kamiyama wasn't afraid to give the characters space to breathe and really develop. We know that some people might be turned off by the pacing of the show since it's not all action all the time. Don't get us wrong, there is action. And when there are action scenes, they are masterfully executed and super exciting to watch. But what really makes Moribito stand out is the character growth. And not just in the main characters, we're talking secondary and tertiary characters too. And for that, you need to slow things down. You know, let things marinate. We guarantee the end result is delicious. Also, on a completely different note, we're just gonna say it and cut straight to the heart of the matter. It was refreshing to see that the animation studio Production IG didn't feel the need to sexualize Balsa's character. They could've, but in fact, they actually seem to go out of their way to preserve her modesty. Saya from Blood the Last Vampire got a similar treatment. Perhaps this is due to Kamiyama's writing, since he did work on both projects. We don't know. Regardless, we were thankful for it. We just people! One of the coolest things about the series that really makes the whole thing so compelling for the audience is just how realistic the world of Moribito is. Each tribe or group of people and their culture, their beliefs, their history is so well thought out that it just works. To the point that you forget that this world is even fictional. And those are the best kind, aren't they? This is in large part thanks to the author of the Moribito book series being an anthropologist, specifically specializing in ethnology, which is a branch of anthropology that according to dictionary.com, analyzes cultures, especially in regard to their historical development, along with any similarities and dissimilarities between them. It also deals with races and peoples and their relations to one another, their origins, and their distinctive characteristics, which is so obvious when watching Moribito. We especially found this to be true when we as the audience start to find out more about the Yaku people. There was one scene in particular that stood out to us. 
which when we saw it, we thought, this smells like realism. Like it had to have been based on something. So of course we did some digging and lo and behold, it turns out that the Nyoro Peninsula of Moribito is possibly based on the Oshima Peninsula, a region that's found on the southernmost tip of Hokkaido, Japan, which up until the Murumachi period was uninhabited by the Japanese. It was, however, inhabited by a group of indigenous peoples known as the Ainu, who are said to have lived in this region for, well, according to their legends. The Ainu lived in this place a hundred thousand years before the Children of the Sun came, and are even thought to have originated from the Jomon people, an ancient civilization found in Japan. Which, on a side note, if you want to watch a good anime featuring the Ainu people, we'd highly recommend watching Golden Kamui, a show that's both extremely entertaining and educational. Personally, we're big fans. Anyway, moving back to Moribito, in the series, the Yaku people, so Tanda or Madame Torugai, are essentially based on the Ainu, and the Yogoese, like Chagum, are based on the Japanese. Now a quick history lesson about the Nayoro Peninsula. After the Yogoese people migrated to Nayoro, they spread throughout the region and established the new Yogo Empire. And the Yaku, who had lived there for as long as they could remember, soon became the ethnic minority. Uh, seeing the connections yet? The Yaku are a simple people who strive to live in balance with nature. They believe in a supernatural realm called Naigu which is a spiritual world that exists parallel to the physical or natural world known as Sagu in which they live. The Yaku also passed down most of their history and culture through oral traditions, which made it a whole lot easier for the Yogoese to come in and spread their own version of events to those around them. And even though it's barely been two centuries since the Yogoese settled in Nayoro, Hardly anyone remembers what Nayoro was like before New Yogo was founded by the hero Torugaru. A lot of this is due to the Yaku either being pushed off their land or being encouraged to make life easier for themselves and assimilate. Well, if this isn't deja vu again, here's the thing. This is exactly what the Japanese did to the Ainu in the 19th century when they annexed Ezo and renamed it Hokkaido. As Japanese settlers came in and colonized the region, the Ainu were discriminated against. They were forced off their land, they were banned from practicing their religion and from performing their cultural rituals such as getting tattooed. I mean, they weren't even allowed to speak their own language. Japan wanted full assimilation, and this wasn't the first time, and not even the worst of it. We'll go over it more on our blog, YouTube's not really the place. But since the Muromachi period, the Ainu people have had to deal with Japanese governments constantly and aggressively trying to stamp out their cultural identities and pretty much their very existence. Very much like the Yogolese are trying to do to the Yaku people. And that's the beauty of fiction. This ugly history is what Nahoko Uehashi tried to display to her audience in a way that they could digest and think about without feeling biased or necessarily attacked. To do this successfully, the author made the clever choice to make Balsa a foreigner to the land, meaning she was neither Yogoese nor Yaku. This way, the audience is also an outsider looking in. So when Balsa questions or disregards certain customs and traditions, she's allowing the audience liberty to do the same. Meaning, not only does Moribito offer some incredible fight scenes, but it's also very deep and thought-provoking, while additionally providing some of the best character growth around. Furthermore, Balsa is just so cool, and is what you'd call true as steel, which means she won't let you down. That's an ironclad promise. And you can confirm that for yourself over on High Dive, where Moribito, Guardian of the Spirit, is currently streaming. Seriously, in our opinion, Moribito is truly the whole package. So make sure to check it out. Also, don't forget to check out our blog, where we'll dive a little deeper into the historical conflicts between the Ainu people and Japan. Now if you enjoyed this video, make sure to click that like button to let us know. And you can also hit that subscribe button for more videos like this. 
Thanks for watching. Stay obsessed.